For the second session, what we want to do is really have an interesting experience of creating a basic you know, building that has floors, walls, uh, windows, doors, all those sorts of things. Give you the experience of kind of creating your own. So you can kind of get ready to start like uh, modeling your own projects. And we'll, we'll see how so far how far we get today and then kind of adapt what we're going to ask you to do tonight based on just how far we get together as a class because, you know, Everything about today is a little experimental about uh, all the software and all the hassles with the networking and stuff like that. Let me see how far it gets. Okay. In terms of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to start out by creating a brand new model. And as you do that, you know, um, on the main screen or rather as you go in, you'll always find some sort of new choice. You'll also find it under the application menu. But we're going to say that we're creating a new project. There are a couple of different things you need to know about in terms of the building modeling, different types of files. One's a project file. That's more like a, a building or something which is actually going to be a really a built element with a collection of different parts. And within those, you're also going to find families. And families are component sub pieces. So when we model a computer or a screen or a table, that's a family that we put into a project. Okay, so families are the smaller things, the complex. But we're going to start out just with a brand new thing, a brand new project. And to do that, I'm just going to say new out here, but it's going to ask us what sort of template we want to work with. I'm going to say the architectural template to get started right now. The truth is, the only difference between these different templates is the type of elements which are put into your project by default. You can always bring more things into the project from the library, but the architectural thing will have, it will be set up in such a way that it's more architectural walls, doors, and windows. If it is structural, it will be more about the beams and the columns and the foundation elements, things like that. But for right now, let's just focus on an architectural one. Create a new project. I'll say OK. And when you do, you'll get something that looks like this. It's kind of a big, blank project. Let's talk about what we have available to us here. So the idea is, this is our drawing area right now. By default, our project only has a couple of different levels. Level 1 and Level 2. There's also a level for the site, which runs the floor plan for the site. We'll take a look at that in a second. We have some different elevations which are set up for us right now. There's the north, east, south, and west. And these are project north, east, south, and west. Those aren't necessarily the true orientation relative to the compass. We can adjust that. Okay, but almost any project really will have something that's considered project north, and we sort of base all our drawings on some sort of grid relative to that. So these different little load markers right here are actually the camera locations right now. We can move them around a little bit in a minute. But by default, default, we have different sort of views for some of the cameras that have already been set up. We also have a space for sheets. We don't have any sheets in there yet, but we're going to ultimately have some sheets in there. We're going to start adding, put all those views together. So how that works is something like this. Okay, properties palette. Again, if yours is over here and you want to drag it over, that's fine, or keep it over there. Either way, just for the map. As we think about trying to use this area here to build who we model, there are a series of different tabs up here at the top of the screen. If you're working with Revit 2013, it's one of the few things you'll see that's different. In Revit 2013, since architecture, structure, and MEP are all together in a single product, the tabs are actually labeled architecture, structure, and systems. From here forward, they're all the same. But architecture, structure, systems. If you're working with Revit Architecture 2012 on one of the workstations here, then what you'll see is it's going to be home. And then you'll find insert and structure. But home will really have all the architectural things. That's the home for that version. If you were in structure, it would be home would be the structural place. Okay, you know, again, I think that's going to be very transparent to you very quickly. But on this tab, you'll find the main elements for the work with. Walls, doors, windows, even roofs and floors. Most of the biggies are right there, very close, you know, very, very readily available for you to look at. So as we go working, there's a couple of things we're typically going to do. Often when we get started, we start with the notion of building the envelope. It's kind of working on the outer skin. And as we do that, we'll look at the walls and the openings in those, and then the other pieces like the roofs and the top. And, Possibly in like curtain walls, which are special variations, somewhere between a wall and a window and a curtain wall, just like a wall of glass, it's all 700. And things like column elements, things like this, which we put here, most of our post cap there too. Okay, let me see if I can sort of move this down a little. As we think about designing the building element, 
there are a lot of requirements now that might be working for. You know, often we're thinking about um, aesthetic things, things that we want to sort of have happen in the facade in terms of solid massing versus more skeletal. We're thinking about the materials from the standpoint, how sustainable they are. But we also typically think about thinking about the walls in terms of functional requirements, really which of the walls the walls are going to be carrying down loads. If we want to have walls to carry down the loads, or we have, a, we have columns which are sort of structural elements to carry them down too. Also functionally, thinking about the thermal separation between the inside and the outside spaces. For example, in this little illustration here, there's probably a lot more thermal resistance in this wall than there is in that part over there. So there's a lot of different trade-offs we make in terms of how we go through these structures. You also think about as you're designing walls, the whole notion of what the construction technique is going to be. You know, how we construct walls or wood frame walls and then go ahead and put siding on the outside of those. It's very different from a like, commercial building where in fact, if you've been watching the construction of the new building, it's actually kind of a really cool spot where you can see the whole structural skeleton, and you're watching them kind of crane in those gigantic panels that have all the uh, limestone on the outside. It looks like it's all made up as a series of limestone blocks, but you're seeing it's all pre-assembled off, and then kind of just attached as panels to the outside of the building. Kind of a cool chance to sort of see what's going on there. Okay. We're going to start thinking about walls, and as we think about walls, let's just kind of start to understand our drawing area here just a little bit first. And one thing we want to think about is really the whole notion of these levels and, oh, it's how the area is set up by default. So in the floor plan view, you can't really see where the levels are set. If you go to any of the elevation views, you can. So why don't you do that as a starting point? How about if we go to, it doesn't really matter which one, north, east, west, or south, it's going to be the same in any of them. Just go ahead and switch over, and I'm going to zoom on in so you can see these little elements over here. These are called level markers. And you'll see that currently right now, level zero, or level one, is set to zero, zero, kind of product, product, case point. And level two is currently set to 10 feet above that. Okay, and that may be a fine assumption. If you want to go through and change that, if your floor to floor height is going to be a little bit different, you can go ahead and type in some other values here. For example, if I want my level two to be, oh, say, nine feet off or eight feet off, whatever it is that I want it to be, I can click on that value. It's boxed in, so I can type in some new value. Let me make it nine feet. And when I say enter, it'll pop it on down. So I can move my levels around. I can go through and take level two. If I want to just move it on up, I can also just drag it up. 11 foot 6 or 12 feet, whatever it is, but you can reset the levels. And the reason we actually like to sort of work with the levels and set the levels is as we're going for the place in the walls, it's actually much more powerful to say that I want to put a wall from level 1 to level 2 than it is to say I want to put a wall from 0 to 8 feet. Okay. If you do 0 to 8 feet, it's always 8 feet, it's not easy to change. If you say it's level one to level two, the nice thing is if level two changes sometime because of some requirement that needs to change, you can change level two and all the walls will grow automatically to meet that. So you're going to find that as we're working, it's almost always better to attach these constraints, to, uh, attach them to different references, and use those in the parameters as opposed to going through and having these sorts of values. So right now I have a space that where my walls are 12 feet tall. You can make them, though, 10 or 11, whatever it is you want to make yours. Okay. If you actually wanted to have a multi-story space, something that is even higher still, what you could do is add another level. For example, you might want to go ahead and have level one and level two, like for me, if it's a single story, level two might be the roof level. I might want to have a level three or have another level called roof, so I have a two-story house instead. If you want to do that, what you can do is as follows. You come on over and the level marker, it's under the Home tab or the Architecture tab. Way over towards the right-hand side, you're going to find this choice called Datum. And under there, you'll find the Level tool. If you choose the Level tool, you can start just dragging levels out. And what it'll do is it'll actually create the next one up in the sequence. So since I had level one and level two, it calls the next one level three. Again, that's just name. You don't have to worry about the name. But if it's not quite at the elevation you want it to be, I can choose that and either move it up and down or type in the value where I want that to be. 
But levels are just a good starting point. Levels are all part of what I'll call a dimensional framework. It's helpful to have your framework set up before you start doing your modeling about really what the four and four heights are going to be, you know, where the grid lines are ultimately going to be. It's nice to get that stuff set up in advance, because then when you model, you can model to those without changing them after the fact. OK, so let's start with that. Do most of you have like um, some levels set up? You have level one, level two, maybe even a level three. Okay. If you're looking good there, why don't you go and we'll switch ourselves back over to the floor plan view. And in the floor plan view, we'll start actually placing some walls. So I've switched back over to the floor plan view. As we start thinking about walls, how many big things you want to think about the walls? As you choose the wall tool, let me choose it first. A number of different things kind of pop up as some variants of like how we're going to go through and place that wall. Let's think about all the different ones that are available. Okay. There is a notion of we're going to place the wall by drawing some lines to indicate where the wall is going to go. And we can here's the drawing tools. We have straight lines, we have rectangles, and different sorts of uh, inscribed or circumscribed like geometry. Radiuses, arcs, you have a number of different ways of drawing that line, that location on the wall. Okay. We have the notion of really as we draw the wall and the wall has true thickness, how will that wall line up relative to the line? Is it centered on that line? Is that line you're drawing the outside surface, the inside surface? There's a lot of different spots on the wall that might represent. And we'll go through and choose that. We also get to choose the height of the wall. Is the height an unconnected 20 feet? That's what it's showing right now. Okay, that would be, I think, one of the weaker ways to do it is to sort of say that it's unconnected, 20 feet, because then it will always be 20 feet. A much better thing in my mind is to say, let's make the height up to level 2, because that will actually lock in that level 2 constraint as opposed to being a specific uh, numeric value. So I'm going to change that to level 2. Okay. So what I will do is basically start my wall at level 1, go up to level 2. Okay, what else do we have in here? Oh, that's pretty good for getting this going. Let's go ahead and start drawing and we'll start thinking about what's going to happen next. Oops, actually, not quite just yet. There's this notion over here of the type of wall. I'm sure we'll do a different wall first. We'll leave it at that and we'll talk about the difference. So I'm going to draw, I'm going to grab my little drawing, start pulling on out. As you pull on out, check out that it's actually putting some dimensions in there. Don't be all hung up on these dimensions because they're really easy to move after the fact. Just go ahead and kind of create some nice surfaces for you. Maybe get something that loops all the way around. Just create some sort of nice closed surface like that. Now, we've been drawing in 2D, but we actually are creating 3D objects. You may not think that we're creating 3D objects, but we actually are. And how you can actually spot that is as follows. If we open the 3D view and the 3D view is not available, hey, where is the 3D view? It's not here just yet. What we can do is go to view and say 3D view. Just click the default 3D view. It'll open that window. And then what you may want to do is tile those two windows so you can see them both side by side. So that will be under view, tile. So now i got a couple different things. I'll even close that elevation view. So I got my floor plan view, and I got the 3D view. Let's see if you can get yourself something that looks like that. You get real close in there. Now the cool thing is, in the same sense that as you touch the thing in any window, you're actually touching it in all the windows, you can go ahead and either by selecting the floor plan or selecting the 3D view, just go ahead and select one of those walls and watch what happens. You'll see, for example, I'll get that wall on the front. As I choose it, notice it's highlighted in blue in the other view too. And now if I go through and move that wall, if I change anything about it, for example, let me just kind of push it back a few feet. You'll see that it'll also change over in the 3D view. So everything's kind of completely interconnected. So go ahead and just try putting a couple walls down there. Let's get some of those outside walls, and we'll start talking about all the variations on this theme. So just putting walls down and sort of moving walls around is actually a pretty easy thing to do. Okay. 
as you're moving walls around, there's a couple things you can sort of play with. Oh, for example, if I choose that wall, you'll see that there's actually some things called temporary dimensions that show up that let us kind of control that wall. Right now, that middle wall is about 32 feet from my left side, about 24 feet from my right side right now. And what happens is if I push and pull it, those dimensions will change. So, for example, if I come on over here and I push and pull, I can change those dimensions. Another thing we can do, though, is actually, if you know you have a specific numeric value that you want to put in here, we can go through and actually type a value. For example, if I know that middle wall wants to be 20 feet away, I can just click on the blue text and just type in there 20. And when I hit enter, it'll go ahead and move it to that location. So I'm going to tell you, as you're putting things in there, it's actually pretty easy to place walls. I don't worry about being very precise when placing them right out of the box because it's very easy to kind of move them around as you go and get them to exactly where you want them to be. Now, as you do move walls around, be aware of this. As you type in values, for example, this wall here and that wall there. If I want those two walls to also be 20 feet apart, and I type 20 feet in here, watch that. I'll put 20 feet in here. And you go over that way instead. So, this doesn't look very controllable. No, I wanted that to be 20 feet over here, too. So you're playing this little game and wrestling with the wall back and forth. And here's what you have to know about the walls. The wall is all, the thing that is going to move when you go through and change things is whatever you have selected right now. So whatever you have highlighted in blue, you're basically saying, hey, that's in the air right now. If anything changes, that's the thing I want you to operate the change on. So if, for example, I wanted to take that outside wall and pull it in, so it's also 20 feet, what I would do is click on the outside wall and type the 20 feet, Okay, then it'll pull it on over. So be aware, whatever is the one that's currently selected, that's the one that's uh, on the table and move at this point. So, so you kind of aware of which one you currently have selected. Now, there's really not a whole lot of difference about whether I move that in 3D or move it in 2D. In 2D, I get a little more precise control, but it's really changing the same object. Okay. Other things to think about on your walls is this wall is what I call a generic wall. The nice thing about generic walls is they really are made of some single generic material. They don't have very much uh, like a true you know, materiality to them. Yeah. Nice thing about generic walls is the inside and the outside doesn't really matter very much. It's just kind of some generic material. Now, as you're modeling though, you're gonna figure out pretty quickly that, hey, generic walls really aren't the way to do it. Because as we go through a model, especially if we're gonna start modeling accurately for something that's gonna be constructed, we actually do care that it has some sort of structural layer, it has some sort of interior finish, some sort of exterior finish. You wanna be cognizant of all those things and design that way. So what can happen is, as opposed to sort of leaving it set to just a generic wall, we're going to use a different wall type. So let's talk about that. If I want to change the wall to a different type, let me even sort of zoom on in here. Okay. That generic 8-inch wall is fine, but if I change it to a different type, for example, this exterior brick on CMU on top of uh, concrete blocks, you'll see it's going to get a lot fatter. Now, if you're wondering why it got better, it really has to do with the different layers of the materials. This view currently is doing a very good job of showing you all those different layers, and that's because by default, it's showing this as a very high level view that's not showing very much detail. If you want to see more detail, if you'd like to see the detail of the wall layers and how it's all constructed and how it goes together, what we do is down at the bottom of the view window, there's this thing that lets us control the level of detail that we're looking at. And if we change it to the fine level of detail or medium, either one, you'll actually see it'll start showing us the concrete block layer, the interior gypsum board layer, that looks like some sort of insulation, some air space, and finally the outside brick on the outside of the wall. Let me go ahead, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shade that view just so we can see the colors a little bit better. 
But as we go through and we change all sorts of different materials over here, let's go ahead and change that to something else. What if it were just a four inch brick wall? That looks like that. Or what if it were oh, some sort of exterior EIFS system on metal studs? Okay. You know, it has a notion of the thickness of different walls and the controlling thickness of the different walls. And to go through and like I guess an accurate construction thickness and really ultimately an accurate understanding of the materials that are involved in each of the wall layers so we can quantify that stuff and estimate it and build it properly. Okay, so we can go changing things around. Now let's go back to my generic wall for just a second. What was it, a generic eight inch wall? Okay. Let's talk about what's happening when the wall changes, because if you put the wall down in generic originally, and then you go changing the types after the fact, something funny happens in terms of the thickness of the walls and where it grows. So have you spotted yet like what it's doing in terms of those walls as it's growing, like uh, what's happening there? What do you think it's sort of centering on right now? Yeah, I think we have it to the center line of the wall right now. And let me kind of even kind of give ourselves a way to look at that. If I go to just uh, the architecture tab, I'm going to look for there's something called a reference plane, which is really just kind of a construction line is a way to think about it. I'm going to sort of draw that at the center line of the wall so we can sort of see. Okay, So if I go through and change this, to a four inch wall or to a very thick wall, okay. notice it's always staying centered. And the reason it's always staying centered is it's because of this choice right up at the top here. It's called uh, the wall location line. That's the center line of the wall right now. Okay. So we're going to leave this. Okay. Let's take this wall over here. Okay. If I wanted to go through and change that and also have it be this material over here, okay. But I didn't want it to sort of grow on both sides. I wanted to say that the new exterior surface is here and just grow in from that. And how about we do that? Change the location. Okay, let's take a look at it. I'm going to come over here. Actually, just to even give ourselves a nice point of reference, I'll give myself that reference line. So that's what I'm trying to honor right there. So I'm going to choose this. So here we are. The currently the location line is set to wall center line. I am hearing that if I go through and choose a different location line, we might be okay. Let's think about these different sort of layers and what's the choices we hear. Okay, wall center line. Okay, that you got a pretty good idea. That's just the physical center of the wall. Okay, core center line. Let's think about where that is. Every wall has this notion of some sort of what's called an interior core, it's usually the structural layers, so it's either the wooden studs or the metal studs or the concrete blocks, something like that. There's some interior finishes to the interior core, there's some exterior finishes to the exterior core. So in this wall over here, the core center line is actually the center line right here. It's the center line of just that CMU block layer. Okay. Finish face exterior, okay, that'll be way out here, that's all the way on the outside. Finish face interior is way on the inside. Okay. Core face exterior interior, it's either that face out there or that face in there. It's the face of the block, or it's the face of the stud. It's not the face of the outer layer. Okay, now, as we go, so we're going to go and fix that wall. You know, you know, we'll talk about what the most sensible choice for you probably is. So I got that wall there. If I want to hold the exterior face, I'll say finish face exterior is really the location line. Again, the nice thing is now is if I go through and change that wall type to whatever I change it to, it'll always hold that line. Okay, so be aware that the location line has that effect for you. We have two different location lines set up here. That's why that's kind of like a little different. Notice that when you actually do have materials coming together at a corner, there's this really nice thing. You can sort of merge and then meld, and something good happens at the point that understands how materials wrap around. Oh, yes, yes. If you accidentally close the property tab, and we do that all the time, it's uh, a couple different ways to do that. But if you go to the view, there's a choice over here called user interface, and properties is right there. So if you've closed it accidentally, that's how you get it back in. 
The other way I think it is is PR. Let me see if that's no. That'll work too. PP. PP. Yep. Thank you. There's a number of ways. Sometimes if you just like hit the wrong thing, it goes away. But ways are there's properties over here which make sure that palette shows up again, or in the user this stuff. So we're going to learn to be aware of the wall center line and like uh, where the core of the wall is versus the outside layer of the walls. Because what's going to happen is we're going to figure out pretty quickly that there's a lot of different wall types we want to work with. Revit has a lot of interesting wall types out of the box, but there certainly aren't all the wall types we typically want to use. So very often what happens is we create wall types and save them away in our own little library. For example, if you want to do some uh, wood frame construction here in Northern California, we do an awful lot of oh, two by six stud walls with either stucco or siding or shingles on the outside, something like that. And that isn't one of the default types that's available in Revit. But if we want to go through and create that, we can. Then we stash it away so we can kind of keep on using it again and again. And I'm going to give you a file with a lot of different wall types in it. We're going to talk more about how to create them. But we'll get that. We'll probably keep on going with that one tomorrow. Let's just kind of just go through just kind of walls that are basically a thing. Okay. So we have some walls. We're creating some basic walls. Some different things to think about are they have a base and they have a top. The top being sort of level two on this wall is base being level one. If you'd like to go ahead and put in a little bit of offsets, you can. And that's actually sort of a useful thing, too. For example, this is showing basically if you want to hold a wall off the floor, okay, you can do that. And let's think about why that might actually be useful. So let's choose this wall over here. If I know that the top of the wall here always wants to be, say, three feet above level one, no matter where level one is, I can say, for the top constraint, let me say, oh, up to level one with a positive offset of three feet. Okay. What that's always, no matter where level one goes, the top of that wall will always be level one plus three feet. And that's kind of sometimes good if you have little balcony walls, if you have little garden walls, or something like that. You want to do something much beyond have a wall that comes up. Another very common thing, though, is you want to do something what I call a soffit wall, where you have something coming down because you're covering some beam. You want to have some sort of closure. So to do a soffit wall, there's a couple ways I could define it. Let me put that back up to level two again. If you know that the soffit wall always is going to come down a certain distance relative to level two, that's three feet above, I can say level two and let's make the top offset. Actually, let me do this. I'm going to make that level one zero at the top. For the base, I'm going to say it's going to sound really strange. Make it level two minus two feet. What that's going to do is it's always going to create something that's uh, two feet of wall from level two. So what is that good for? What this is nice about, if you have something and you're defining it relative to level two, if you go through and I change level two, for example, if I push level two up a few feet, Okay, notice that it stays at two feet, because it's always defined as level two minus two feet. Now, there's another way to construct that, and on, well, I don't mean to be sort of belabor, just kind of like useless detail, but another way to construct it that's kind of useful to know about is if instead of thinking about it as being level two minus two feet, you might be thinking about the opening that you're trying to create there as really being it's level one plus two. You can sort of think of it either way, whether you want to sort of divide it as being relative to the top or relative to the bottom. If I do something like that, for example, if I say the bottom is level one plus eight feet, like that, the nice thing is now this opening is not going to change regardless of where level two moves. So it's really need to think about the how you want to base them, what you want them to be relative to, whether it's relative to level two or whether it's relative to level one. But base offsets and big pop offsets is something that's sort of more available for you to start playing with in terms of like how you do control of that. So that's just a starting point. Let's go ahead and come back over here to your walls for just a second. I'll go back to that floor plan view.
Oh, that's interesting. Over here, you don't see it anymore because again, the bottom of that wall is now above the four foot cutting plane. Let me just bring it back down again to zero. Okay, let's come on and how about this? Let's get our little uh, floor plan site view over here. Let me zoom to fit it. Yes. Is the ceiling plane four feet below the ceiling or four feet above the floor? That's a good question. And I'll help you figure that out in just a second. Let's go over here. If you say the ceiling plan view, there's something called the view range. Let's see how it's defined. It looks like actually the way it's defining it is actually at seven foot six above the level one. But you could again go ahead and put a negative offset in there if you want to. You've got to define it versus the other level instead. Cool. No worries. Okay. So let's go ahead and just to give ourselves a little context. Oh, what do we want to design here? Let's go ahead and do this. We're going to go through and put together some basic little cottage. It's going to look something like this. Okay, we need to go through and we'll think about putting some interior walls in here. So what are we going to do? Maybe we'll have an interior wall that comes across here and that'll be our bedroom. Maybe it'll be some sort of like bathroom in a closet over here and that'll be our main living area. We'll put some doors on here. I just like always like to think about what we're doing. Maybe we'll put some windows out here. Maybe put a window over here, whatever it is. Let's start thinking ahead to what we're going to be designing so you have a little bit of an idea of what you have in mind. So what we'll do is we've got our little space over here. Let's think about how we can go ahead and let that happen in the same way. So I got some basic walls hanging around out here. I'm going to turn those up again to the higher level of detail, just so I can see them all. How about for this? Let's go ahead and make them all the same wall type, so we're not going to change these things. If we want to do that, we can go through and choose them all one after the other and change that one. Then I can choose this one and change its type. And I can choose that one and change its type. But a really quick way we might want to do this is you can either control click to get a bunch of them. And change those all. Or if you want to, you can just drag around them all and select them all and change them all that way. But why don't you do this? Why don't you go through and like uh, see if you can change all your different walls to like the same material. Now, as you look at this building, let me go back to it in 3D so we can say, take a look at it that way again. Hmm. Can't see much difference there. Let me see if I can shade it and see the difference. It's pretty boring in terms of what's going on that way. In the floor plan view, I can actually see, though, that I got a little bit of a problem back over here. Can you spot it? I actually do have a location where when I was messing around with dimensions, I've actually flipped one of the walls inside out. So what's happening, the exterior is here, the exterior is here. On this one, I actually have the interior and the exterior surfaces flipped. Let me go ahead and flip that around by choosing it and rotating it back out. That way we can actually like uh, have the exterior surface on the outside too. But let's go ahead and start by putting some exterior walls down. Then we'll think about sort of adding some more to this. Okay, so the big thing for the exterior walls are we're going ahead, kind of placing them down and figuring out the materials on the outside and adjusting them to the top of the bottoms, the location lines. Once you've done that, we can start playing around with different sort of wall types. Now, of these different wall types, we have some ones in here. For example, if we go through and we look at this wall type, You'll see that this is something called EIFS on metal studs. Okay. It has some sort of thickness to it. And if we want to sort of explore a little bit more about it, we can say edit the type and actually see more about how the wall is actually constructed. So within here, we know that this wall is just over a foot thick. It knows that. But how it figures that is that there's a bunch of layers to the wall. 
and you can actually look at the structure of the wall, add up all the different layers to get the true thickness. So if I say edit the structure of the wall, okay, you can see it's actually made up a lot of different layers. It's got some metal studs, it's got plywood on the outside, some sort of air infiltration barrier, an air gap, and kind of the EIFS system on the outside. So when we take all these different things, these two layers right here, that's the core. And this metal studs is the core. Anything above that is exterior to the core versus interior to the core. So we have all these different layers that make up our wall. Now, this wall is a little bit confusing, or a little bit you know, compound in terms of what's going on. Let's think about how you could actually create a wall which may be more like what you want a wall for you to do. For example, if we were going to go through and construct a wall for here in Northern California, again, doing residential construction here on campus, for example, we might want to have a wall that looks something like this. We would say that we would have a wall, nowadays we would almost certainly build it out of two by six studs. We could argue about whether it should be 16 inches on center or 24 inches, depending on our construction technique. On the outside, we have we probably have some oh, half inch of plywood. On the inside, we probably have about a half inch or five eighths of an inch of uh, gypsum wall board. And then on the outside, we probably have some sort of surface material, whether that's shingles or siding or stucco, should be some sort of material. On campus here, you'll find an awful lot of buildings made of stucco where, oh, we have something on one inch is probably a pretty good approximation for stucco or plaster on the outside. And that's how our basic wall assembly works. So here's the deal. Over here in the assembly, you'll see, well, hmm, okay, that's exactly what this one looks like. If I went pulling on down through the list, you'd actually find there isn't one that quite looks like that right now. For example, if I go pulling on down here, you'll find all these generic walls, but I don't find anything that quite looks like that. So here's what you got to do. You basically got to take any wall that you already have constructed and duplicate it and change it to be the type that you want. And that's going to be the most common thing we're going to keep on doing as we keep on working here. You always find the thing that's close, and when it's not quite what you want, you duplicate it, you copy it, and then you change it to be what you want it to be. So if I wanted to go through and create something which is 2 by 6, half inch, half inch, and 1 inch on the outside there, here's how I do that. I'm just going to choose one of them. It doesn't really matter which one I want to do. No, oh, let me even go. Let's see the brick on the sea. Yeah, I don't know. Which is going to be a good starting point. None of them are really all that close. I'll say. I'll say CMU on metal studs. That's a good starting point. We'll edit it. Now, if I want to actually change the definition of this wall, I can, but instead what I'm going to do is edit the structure. And by editing the structure, what I mean is as follows. I'm going to say, edit it, get myself on out to this layer, and let's take a look at what we can do. The structure layer in the drawer, and let's kind of start with that one. Okay. So in terms of the structural layer, let's think about that. Pull that over there in a little bit. If we're going to, oh, got a lot of stuff going on here. Stop, stop, stop. I clicked too quick. Okay, let's start with a two by six stud layer. How thick should the two by six stud layer be? Okay. It's, it'd, be, oh, it'd be so nice if things were actually six inches, but they're not. They're actually five and a half inches. <laughs> so two by six studs are five and a half inches wide. Two by four studs are three and a half inches long. It's like a dimensional lumber versus actual dimensions. So we're going to give a layer that's like five and a half inches thick. We also would like to go through and give it some sort of material properties. Notice as soon as I go through and put in that five and a half, what's going to happen is the thickness of the wall is going to change. Let's just keep on changing as we do this. Actually, I take that back. Let me cancel out of this. I should have uh, been duplicating first. Before I change all these things, let me duplicate it. Then I'm going to say 2 by 6 stud wall plus stucco. Let's start with that. Otherwise, I'm changing the CMU wall. 
probably going to go through this. So what we'll do is we'll edit the structure of this wall as opposed to that other wall. I'll say structure. Again, I'm going to change that to 0, 0.5.5 for five and a half inches. Okay. And now we need to go ahead and assign some sort of material here. Now, for the material there, it's really what we want to do is choose the material that is it's really the one that sort of most closely approximates the solar properties that we want us to put in there. So, it's probably not in the whole studs. If I start thinking about the interior wall, like the two by six studs that are either like uh, you know, 16 inches or 24, what's the predominant material that's inside those walls typically? Is that? That needs some sort of insulation in there? There's almost always some sort of there's dimensional lumber and some sort of bad insulation in that. So what we tend to do is we'll come over through and say right in here, let's choose a material. And now we go through and seeing if we can choose the material that's already been defined. And we have a bunch of materials that are already here. Let's see if I can find some sort of bad insulation. Scroll on up. Now, if there's not a material that we need, we could always create a new material. It's under fiberglass. Let's see if I can find anything here. I'll find some exterior insulation, rigid insulation. I'm not seeing some nice sort of bad insulation in there. Is anyone seeing bad insulation? It's going to, oh, this is one that'll look a little bit different if you're in 2012. I'll warn you about that. Your, your dialogue is a little bit simpler than this. Let me even go ahead and just pull down under here. Then I'll say insulation here. I'll say fiberglass bat. I can add it in by just double clicking it there. Yes. So I've added it into the list. I can choose that and say OK. What happens is as we go through and we change those different material values, the nice thing is actually the power value of the walls can continue to be updated and computed for us. So when it comes time to actually do an analysis of the energy we'll be asking it, you can go through the different materials again. Okay. At the outside layer, right now it's showing this wall as being three quarter inch of plywood. I'm going to say that for my little wood frame house, it's probably going to be more a half inch or five eighths of an inch, something like that. So maybe zero, zero point five. We'll do that. It gives me the half inch. Okay. For my stucco, I probably don't actually have this whole thermal air three inch layer there. So what I'll probably do is actually just choose that and delete that layer because I don't care about that one. Now I need some sort of finish layer on the outside, like a plaster or a stucco, something like that. It wants to be about an inch thick. Currently, it's about seven and five eighths inch thick. That doesn't sound very good. So let's go ahead and make it about an inch thick. And then let's find a material that will match that too. So I'll say concrete. And let's see if I can find some either plaster or stucco. Let's see what I got here. Not looking good there. Let me come on down here into my little library again. I'll go down to my plasters. Looks like they have stucco under there. I'm going to double click it to kind of pop it up there. And now I can choose it in this list. And I can choose that as the material. Now, what we are going to do ultimately is yeah, give you a wall to work with. So, you know, for this time, I'm going to give you actually something that actually has some walls and it's all in put together. But this is how I went much in favor them. Just by going through and changing these different layers, assigning different materials properties to them. You know, I'm going, we're going through and creating it on the fly. You can always change it on the fly, but actually, for what you're going to be working on, I'm actually going to give you a starting point file that actually has a couple different wall types in it. A stucco wall, a wood siding wall, as well as a shingle wall. Okay, so you can kind of choose whichever one you want to work with. And it'll have the right thickness that goes with that, it'll have the right thermal properties that go with that. Yeah, you can start just choosing those things. Okay.
So if I'm going to go through and choose my two by six walls, suds walls with circle on the outside, it's only now seven and a half inches thick. One thing's going to happen is the building's probably going to change its size because based on whether it's where the location lines were, looks like currently we just have that one chosen. Okay. Let me zoom on out there. If I want to change them all to be that same material, again, I can go through and, oh, I'm going to choose them all. I actually have some reference lines in there. I have to get rid of them too. Okay. And now I can choose. Two by six studs and stucco. Okay, now I've got a bunch of walls that are all that. And I look at the 3D view. Let's take a look at that. Maybe shade that. Maybe realistic. Yeah, this is not very informative right now in terms of like being a very good representation. So I'm going to go and adjust that wall just a little bit more. For example, my inside and my outside wall both look like a pretty even level of gray. What I might want to do is say, hey, let's take that gypsum wallboard and I'll make it very light, like almost a white color so I can really spot the inside. And maybe on the outside, put a little bit of pattern on the outside to be more like stucco or some sort of stickily surface so you can see them. And again, that's just more sort of a graphic thing to kind of like a, help you understand what you're doing. I can edit that wall type. For all these different materials, they not only have thermal properties and things like that, they actually have appearance properties that go with them too. So if you, for example, go to the gypsum wall board and we open that material, let me double click on that, you'll see that it actually has appearance properties. So if I go to the appearance properties here, it has sort of a color to it right now. Right now it's kind of a medium gray, but it's not as white as I'd like it to be. I'm going to make it even whiter. I'll say done with that. Okay, then let's also go ahead and adjust that stucco property. So what I've done so far is I just sort of made the walls a little white, lighter white on the inside. Let me go ahead and get that stucco property though too though, because I'll say stucco. I'll change its properties. I'll double click on that. In terms of its appearance properties, oh, let's see what we got there. If we scroll on down there, that's the image that it looks like right now. Let me see what else I can do here. Oops, hang on. I think it's just under the, the graphics properties. Let's go ahead. I'm going to tint my stucco oh, like a brown color or something like that, just so it's easier to spot. And I can even give it a pattern. So right now it doesn't have any pattern, but if I choose a pattern, and this should be much more like uh, what you're used to, like uh, working with AutoCAD, you can choose a hatch pattern for it. So let me choose a model pattern that'll scale nicely. No, maybe not. Drafting. I'm going to choose like a dense sand or something like that. What's the effect of doing all this? Let me kind of pop this back out. All I've really been doing there is just changing the appearance. That is interesting. That sure looks like it is. Oh, it's realistic. Let's go to the shaded colors. There we go. So now you can start seeing the interior walls versus the exterior wall. We got a little stickly pattern on the outside versus the inside. This is all about kind of changing the layers. Again, we're going to have a chance to kind of keep on playing with the layering of the wall and start to become a good athlete some of these a lot more over the next couple of days. But for now, we're going to give you some wall types to kind of work with. I just want you to know where they came from. Okay. Once you have the basic walls, there's a couple other types of things you might want to do. For example, if your wall or if your building has both interior and exterior walls, you may want to go through and create some interior partition walls too. And to do that, what we'll do is we'll go back to the architecture tab and we will choose. Well, let's pop on down here. Interior, oh, we got some different sizes in here. This is all based on 5 8 inch uh, sheetrock right now. We can adjust it, but I'm going to just use the interior 4 and 7 8 inch partition wall right now. Typically, our walls are about four and a half inches, and uh, the wall, the file I'll give you will have them that way. 
And what you can do is just start drawing some interior walls. So why don't you try this? Try just kind of putting some interior walls across. Sort of subdivide your space a little bit. See if you can kind of break up the space a little bit. You know, put a closet over here. Okay, again, as I'm drawing, I'm drawing all my walls up to level two. Okay, so things are looking pretty good over there. If I come back in now and I look back at it in the 3D view, we're looking at something that looks like this. So let's pause there for just a second and kind of like just checking with people how you're doing with walls and how the whole notion of drawing walls. The whole thing I know about putting all the layers together in the wall and customizing the wall assembly, and the layers could be a little mucky and confusing in terms of what's going on in the practice that some more. But in terms of just getting some basic walls down, is that looking pretty good? Some basic interior exterior walls? We can kind of get that. Okay. The big thing again to keep in mind is the material on the wall, so what the type is, and just what the top and the bottom of the walls are. Okay. If you're good on walls, let's go down to the next basic concept that you typically run into. And that's, well, I'll leave out the holes in walls right now. We're just going to go straight to windows. All these things that we're talking about, there's handouts, and we have lots of videos, kind of but also have to be simple, so you kind of get to do a good stopping point for the day. And one thing we want you to be able to do is put windows in your walls. So windows, let's talk about them. Windows are actually an example of a part for a family, and there's different sizes that are available. You put them into the structure, and you can change the size if you need to. So let's kind of show you what you mean by that. If you go through and... Let's go back to our floor plan view. I can even do it in the 3D view. And I choose the window tool. Let's see what happens. With the window tool, very much similar to what happened with the uh, wall tool, there's all these properties of whatever you're adding. And by default, there's only a couple window types in there. There's like fixed 36 by 48. Let's pull on down there. We've got a bunch of fixed windows. They're different sizes. So fixed windows, those are the ones where they don't really move. It's just like a piece of glass that's locked in there, different sizes. So let's try putting a couple of those in there. And you can choose one of these sizes you want to put in there. Oh, I'll put in some 36 by 48s. And I'll put in some 36 by 72s. So I'll choose a size. And I'll just drop them in. As you drop the windows in, if you can slightly kind of lean, like with your mouse, if you can pull just ever so slightly to the outside of the window, that'll help determine which is considered the inside face versus the outside face. So let me show you what I mean. I'll zoom right in and get a little bit closer. So here I am. I'm going to put this window in. Given the choice of being just to the inside or just to the outside, I'm going to drop it just to the outside because that's going to go through and put the window so the outside is on the right face. If I get it wrong, in fact, you can see I did get it wrong on this one down here. You see that this window is a little bit different than those? This one actually has the glass on the inside wall as opposed to the outside wall, and that's just flipped. So again, if I need to fix something like that, what I have to do is just go ahead and select it. And just like the walls, we have this little guy that lets you flip it over. And you get the inside back to the outside. So as you're placing those things, you're actually placing them in 3D also. Let's take a look at that. There they are in 3D. So you can go ahead and work in 3D. You can actually do all the things that you might want to do in 3D. You can move them up. You can move over. You can do all sorts of things in 3D as well as 2D. It doesn't really matter. Whatever scheme is going to work through that best for you. We can also choose to put in some different sizes. For example, oh, let me put in some of those bigger 36 by 72s. Okay. So six foot tall ones. I'm going to put it over. I just changed that last one because I had it selected when I made the choice. Let me put that back to a 48. 
I'm going to just choose the window tool and then shift choose the 36 by 72. And now when I come on over here, I can place this in. Actually, you might have noticed something interesting happening right there. It complained that actually an insert was conflicting with the join wall. Here it was basically because my, my window right where the cross wall was kind of butting into it. So it's complaining about that. It's going to let me do that, but also that should fix that. We're going to move in the window or move in the cross wall or something like that. But we're going to just place windows in here. And again, it doesn't really matter whether I'm placing them in, in 2D or I'm placing them in 3D. If I go back to the 1D, 2D view. You see, there they are. So if I wanted to go through and fix that, that's, I think, the one that's conflicting right now. I can move that over, and I'll go back to the 3D view, and it'll all be fine. So go ahead and just uh, like uh, place windows in there. Now, as you're placing windows, you might have the question of, well, really, how does it know what height it should be? And every window has some sort of notion of it's the default head height, of how high it should be off the floor. By default, they try to come to seven feet off the floor, typically. In US residential construction, often what we do is we put the heads of windows at either six foot eight or seven or eight. It kind of depends on what our door height is. We almost always match the top of our windows to the top of doors. Okay, so whatever the convention is you're using like in the design, whether it's 80 inches, which is six foot eight or seven feet, you can go through and choose the window that you want to change. And then you can go through, and right now you'll see this is at seven foot 11, I can say six foot eight. Or if I have a whole bunch of them, I can choose that one. I'm going to control click and get that one and make them both six foot eight. Notice that when I choose several things, if there is an uneven answer, let's see if I can demonstrate this. For example, over here, if I choose one of those, it will show me sort of a value. As soon as I choose two of them and there's sort of an uneven information to report, so for example, I chose that one and this one. Notice it widened itself out. There's no answer in there. That's because there's not a single value. There's actually multiple. You can't report a single value. So what you can do if you want to fix that is type in six foot eight. Okay, and as soon as it's a unified answer, it'll show up for both those things. Okay, so we got some walls. We got a few windows in here. Let's talk about a couple of variations on the theme. One is you may have a design in mind that doesn't just involve all these big old flat fixed windows. You may have something a little more elaborate in mind. Maybe like double hung windows or casement windows that swing open. You probably have something in mind besides just a bunch of fixed windows and you might get a little ventilation in the house. And how you can do that is as follows. If I choose the window tool all by itself, you'll see by default, there's not a whole lot of variation in that. It's just all these fixed windows, and that's pretty boring in design and work. So if you would like to go ahead and have a little more flexibility, a little more freedom to work with other things, what we have to do is load some things in from the library, and then you could have a lot more. In fact, you have a lot of things that are built into the Revit library you can load in, but really almost any window manufacturer puts their whole library out there too. So you can actually pull in real components from uh, Anderson or Pella or Marvin or whoever window manufacturers you want to be working with. We can pull them in. And how we do that is if you want to load a family, it's up here in the toolbar. Loading a family takes you out to the library where you can go scrolling on down to the window section and take a look at what's available. So what I got? I got some double hung windows here. I got some combination windows that have a round top on them. I have some casement windows that have some grids in them. I have an arch top window. Really whatever it is you're interested in sort of bringing in there. For example, if I want this arch top window, I think that'll be very decorative and I want to include that. I'll just say open it. What happens is I'm bringing it into my project. Okay, at this point it isn't placed yet. If I place a new one, I can choose one of the sizes that are available. Again, I'm bumping into a wall there. Or I can choose one of these existing ones and change it over to one of those arch tops. So you can always go through and change the types of things and really 
this whole ability to go through and have libraries for things and change the network, that's where you get so much power out of all this stuff because you don't have to go through and do all the drafting and dimensioning and everything to figure out what the size of those windows are. You can bring in entire libraries of windows and just choose one by a model number. They bring it in there and it'll render itself appropriately in all the different views. So for example, that was my little arch top window. It was kind of good looking. Let me bring in another one just to give you an example. I'll say window, I'll load on in. How about if I bring in some double hung windows? Double hung windows are another type that people like. Say windows, very common in our construction around here. Let me put a double hung with the trim. Okay, and you can start placing those in here. We have double hung windows instead. Now, this is one, it's a really a lot more detailed. If you look at this one, there actually is a fair amount of distinction between the inside sash and the outside sash and how all the different trim pieces work together. Now, a lot of times, windows, when you bring them in, you say, well, okay, that's pretty nice. That's close to what I had in mind, but you know, my design's a little bit different. I have really big trim on the outside or really small trim on the inside, whatever it is. And for most of these different things that are library parts, you can change all that. There's sort of these sizes and these parameters which control the way it appears right now, but if you want to edit it, you can start looking at really sort of what type of parameters control its behavior and change them. For example, for this particular window at this size, there's this whole notion of really what is the trim width on the inside and the outside. It's three and a half on both four sides right now. If you're working on an old uh, historical house and you need a much bigger trim on the outside, six inches or eight inches or something like that, all you need to do is go through and change this parameter. And when you say, okay, you have a much different type of trim there. And that's, again, really one of the advantages of sort of working in a system like this, in that the object actually contains some intelligence about what needs to happen, and you can drive it parametrically. So in terms of how that window is going to appear, and all the elevation views, and the 3D views, and the section views, I can change the parameter once, and the geometry adapts, and then all the views adapt to show the correct uh, representation of the geometry. And that's really, really powerful because then, as designers, if you need to go through and keep on revising things and making changes, you change it once and everything else sort of inherits that change. So the ability to go through and change things parametrically is huge. So let me zoom on out there. Okay. Another thing you can do with the parameters, though, let's go ahead and take a look at those parameters. Hmm. The height of the window, uh, the trim projection, the trim width. That's all looking good there. The width. Another set of parameters you might notice that are available there are the height and the width of the window. Let's see about how we can use this. So you're popping around in here, you're looking through the window menu, and you're seeing, oh, I got double hung windows up to 36 by 48. But I wanted a window that was 48 inches wide by 60 inches tall. And you have some other size that isn't automatically in there right now. Okay. And you want to create that. And you don't want to create it from scratch. You just want to be able to go ahead and use the parameters to create that window for you. So here's what you got to do. As usual, I'll start with one that's kind of close to what I want. Yeah, it doesn't have to be precise, but close. I'll say, hey, let me edit it. I always edit the type. But then as opposed to just changing the parameters, I'll duplicate the type. Because when I duplicate the type, I can create a new type and give it the parameters that I want. So for example, here what I'm going to do is say, OK, you want a 48-inch, and this is just a name, by 60-inch window. OK, so far that's just a name, just so I can choose it in the menu. OK, so now I have basically a placeholder for 48 by 60. What I can start doing is actually just changing the parameters to actually reflect that. So what do I want to do here? I'll change the width to be 48 inches. I'll change the height to be uh, 60 inches. And we'll have our new size window. So let's go ahead and do that. 
Okay, in terms of the height, I said that was 60. Actually, I should tell you, it makes no difference whether you say five foot zero or zero foot 60, it's gonna work the same. It's, it, it does all the math for you. So zero, 60 is just as fine as five foot zero, either way. Same thing with width. That could be zero, 048 or four foot zero. Doesn't really matter, both of them will be the same. Say okay to that. We now have a new window. Okay, and we now have a window that we can use throughout our project right now that has that new size. Okay, so here's where the real beauty of this comes from, because all the kind of cool windows we have to do with really sort of a special case. You're going to find that almost everything we go placing in buildings is actually a family. Okay, in families that have parameters that control the size of things. So whether I want a window as a different size, or whether I want a desk or a chair that's a different size, I put these different parts in, Okay, let the database take care of keeping track of all the different parts, so I track those parts and kind of control them parametrically and kind of say what uh, the geometry should happen. You know, in terms of how this should be drawn. So, the Windows, actually, that's, that's kind of the essence of the story on Windows. And just to real quickly give you something to work with, let's kind of talk about doors, because doors are ever so similar in terms of what you want to do here. Okay. For the doors, it looks more like this. Doors, again, sort of a library part. Go ahead and choose the door. You have the single flush door. Oh, how boring. Kind of in here, it's a single flat panel door. I can place the doors in here. Hopefully not conflicting with walls. I can put them in the floor plan too. Again, these single flush doors. Let's see if I can get to that there. Not a good location. Better location. Flip it over, maybe change the rotate the hinging. Okay. So you put doors in, that's gonna work out pretty easily. If you can place windows, you can place doors. Without a doubt. Yeah. Doors are almost are always simpler than windows. But in terms of doors, the same sort of thing is gonna happen here with doors. If the single boring, single flush door doesn't light your fire and you want to put something else in there to kind of express your design creativity, what you can do is go out and load a family and check out what else we got indoors. You'll find, oh, the bifolds, curtain wall doors, kind of a special thing. We'll talk about them tomorrow. Double doors, double glass doors, double glass doors with grids, double doors with panels. So let's do that double door with grids. Maybe for my patio door, I'll put this one in instead. So again, I can choose some different sizes. If I don't like the size, I can sort of create a new size. But we'll put a couple of these like uh, patio doors out here. And all of a sudden we have a way to get from the inside to the outside and that works pretty quick. Right. So I know I just rushed to that at breakneck speed, but I think as you start playing with doors and windows, you're actually gonna find it's very, very similar to each other. It's kind of the essentially the same concept. Okay. So let me do this just to sort of finish up because we only got about 10 minutes left here now or less. Let me give you an idea of where we're going. I'll talk about the assignment that I was going to give you and then we'll subset it to sort of what we can do based on what we've already learned so far. We're all into all that stuff. Okay. Where this is going to go next, just so you sort of know, is, and again, don't worry about following this. This is the real quick teaser for what's coming up. It's the preview of the coming attractions. Tomorrow we're going to learn how to put our floor under this thing. We're also going to learn about the roof. But the roof basically looks something like this. Let me kind of give it a real quickie for you. I can say I'm going to draw the footprint of the roof. You're going to see that what we can do is basically pick walls and specify an overhang for how far we want that to hang out. Then, then just go through and pick the walls that are the boundaries of the roof. So far, so good. I know. Don't worry if you didn't get that procedurally, but conceptually, you sort of did understand what I just did there. I just sort of traced the outside boundary of the house. Okay. Once I do that, I can say, let's finish it. Come on, you. There it is. I now got a roof on the house. The cool thing about parametric roofs and stuff like that, and if you've had to do roof plans, you know that was actually pretty cool in terms of what it just did. The cool thing about doing roofs and things like that parametrically is as follows. If, for example, you go back and you change the plan of the house, I think that's the wall, and I said, you know, this really wants to be my personal bowling alley <laughs> over there. OK, 
Okay, the roof went through and did what it wanted to do there. Okay. Or if I wanted to go through and change the slope of the roof, that's a little slopey. Let's make it a little flatter. I'll do that. Oops, hang on. What did I do there? Yes. I'll change the slope of the roof right here, make it three. Or if you decide that, for example, you don't like hip roofs, you actually like gable roofs or some other sort of structure, we're going to learn all about how we can change them just by doing things like saying, you know, that side over there, I really don't want that side to have a slope. So I can turn the slope off and kind of make that a gable roof or something like that. So it's good. there's a lot of power in what goes on with roofs and all that type of stuff, but it's actually very, very quick. It's really kind of weird, but actually one of the hardest concepts is the walls, just because there's a lot of complex layers to it. But if you hand the idea of layers and walls, you can find out that roofs and floors have layers, and a structural layer and a finish layer and things like that works exactly the same way. You have sketch boundaries and create them. And it's really all now just a matter of kind of putting some different components in there to kind of pull it out. So, when it comes time to put furniture in there, when it comes time to put plumbing fixtures in there, even beams and columns, it's going to be that same sort of operation. Okay, so, and I didn't get as far as I wanted to today, but let me kind of give you something to kind of think about relative to next time. So you can have something to work on tonight if you want to. And again, we'll, we'll sort of revise the uh, due dates and all this stuff accordingly. But basically, here's what we want you to do. Yeah, out there on the uh, L drive, there is a starting point file for you. It's right out here. Okay, um, it actually contains some wall types already, which are like uh, static wood frame walls, with uh, siding, with stuff over the shingles and stuff like that. Some things are sort of appropriate for building here in Northern California residential. Go ahead and use it as a starting point. I want to kind of give you a sense of what the assignment's going to look like. And we'll just sort of do what we can tonight with the idea that we'll sort of like uh, go further with it tomorrow. The idea is what I want you to do is ultimately model sort of some sort of simple wood frame structure. Okay, let's, uh, we'll just put TVD for right now. We'll figure this out. We'll probably have it due the next day. Okay, but what we want you to ultimately do is basically create a little wood frame structure, okay, where what we're going to do is actually just try and design for a specific program. The program we had in mind is we're trying to put together a little field research station that can be in Jasper Ridge, which is kind of a little environmental injury very close to here, where all some students can work. And they're out there in the field, just have a little field research station with some desks, a lab bench, a little space to work, you know, so they're not just kind of out there in the field all the time. So the idea is we're trying to create a building of somewhere around 500 square feet, and you can think about that in terms of even before you lay down like a lot of things in terms of the BIM model, about, you know, what is that? That's 10 by 50, that's 20 by 25. It's not a huge space. It's not like designing a four bedroom house. This is a relatively small space. Within there, we like, oh, some workspaces for the researchers. And it's really like desks and chairs. It's not like you have a credenza and like a lot of stuff built around you because you see the amount of space. It's really pretty much a table and a chair, you know, not separate offices. It's all sort of working in a big pen sort of situation. Maybe some lab bench to kind of put our instrumentation. It's not a meeting area. It doesn't have to be a conference room, but really at least the corner of the room where we could put down a table and some chairs and a whiteboard. It's just some place to kind of have a chalk talk as opposed to a board meeting. Okay, something like that. Uh, what else? You want to put in an ADA compliant bathroom. If you're wondering what one of those looks like, go check out the bathrooms on the first floor over here by Koopa. Okay, where there's a certain way you have to arrange them relative to a five foot radius for a wheelchair to get in there and kind of pivot it around. Okay, so there's we can talk more about that tomorrow, but it's, it's not a very skinny thing because it really it has to be about five by eight foot to work right in terms of a wheelchair getting in there and getting pivoting the needs here. Okay. And lots of south facing windows to capture light and heat and make them operable so we can actually, like, you know, not have overheat during the summertime, but get some sort of breeze going through. So, in terms of if you're familiar with uh, construction here in Northern California, a simple wood frame structure with a simple concrete slab, some light frame walls, just take a look at all this stuff in there. But to get you started, there's that starting point file. And really, what we're going to ultimately want you to do is sort of model some walls, some doors and windows, and get the floor and the roof in there. Okay, so just really 
But what you could do as of today, you could think about your overall design and start putting the walls and the doors and the windows in there. Maybe not the floor and the roof. We'll kind of keep on going with that tomorrow as we sort of pick up this thread. But ultimately, you're also going to be putting in some infill objects. We'll show you tomorrow about putting in plumbing fixtures, putting in furniture, and how we can take all this model and hopefully put it onto a sheet view. And the real quickie on that, so I'll let you go here in a second here, is as follows. You're going to say, let's do level one. We're going to say, let's go through and uh, word sheets go. I'll find them yet. There it is. Create a new sheet. Now it's a new floor plan view. It's funny, my uh, view is very, there it is, sheets, new sheet. My view is very uh, squishy. But when it comes time to actually put your views on sheets, it really looks like this. It's going to, you know, watch care. Oh, it's going to be a lot. This is a lot of work. What you got to do is drag it all the way over here and drop it. And that 3D view, oh, that's even more work. Come on, do it. There it is. Okay, so that's what you're going to do on the tail end of this. It's going to just basically create your views. We're going to go ahead and crop them a little bit, make them look nice, and then grab them in and kind of create some nice sheets. Okay. But if in the meantime, if you're all over and halfway through the need for design and you just want to play with that stuff, please do. Okay, so on the L drive, again, you'll find the starting point file, as well as this little write up for what the assignment is. Ignore the due date for now, but go ahead and if you can't get yourself started tonight, I want to give you something fun to work on, you know, because you know clearly you don't have enough to do between now and the beginning of the quarter. So like, uh, just get started with it. The first thing you with it now, the easy it'll be a little bit later in terms of what's going on. So again, the starting point file, the assignment file, have some fun with it, and we will see you back tomorrow morning.